So I'm going to show some photographs. Um, photographs I'm going to show come from Twine and Weir archives and museums because um, there I found publicly available mugshots. I couldn't get access to Borsetshire uh, Constabulary's... Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so in recent months, Ambridge seems to have been suffering from an appalling crime wave. As a criminologist, I don't want to cause alarm, and mostly I find that it's my role to reassure people that until very recently, we had an unprecedented period of declining crime rates, and I want to reassure all of you too. Things aren't always what they seem, and you mustn't rely on the Echo's reporting of crime. <laughs> <laughs> Last month, the Office for National Statistics and DEFRA released annual crime rates, and these say that for a predominantly rural village of a similar size to Ambridge, we, each year we'd expect around 17 incidents of violence against the person, five domestic burglaries, and five vehicle offences. And when I say vehicle offence, I mean Josh type, rather than Matt Crawford type. <laughs> <laughs> so even if we consider that only about 45% of crime is, recorded, uh, is reported to the police, Ambridge is not suffering from an epidemic of criminal activity like, say, Midsummer, just down the road. <laughs> is lower than in urban sites, but rural policing plans try to counteract farming communities' distrust in the police capabilities. Constables who work and live in a large geographic spaces with scattered communities have a job on their hands, which isn't always helped if they're considered to be adept to lying to the village cricket team. <laughs> so perhaps PC Burns is helping raise the awareness of the police in Ambridge. This could lead to a higher trust and confidence in the police, which then might have an impact on reporting crime, crime and reductions in the fear of crime. So, the Archers, despite what we might have felt in the last two or three years, isn't a crime drama. Yet it does help us think about crime and offenders not only in Ambridge, but in the communities within which we live. Perhaps we think about Ambridge, when we think about Ambridge, we're being willfully nostalgic about the rural tranquility of the past, where a little like bunting theft was the order of the day. <laughs> Ambridge offenders might be split into three categories, but I have to say, in the last few months, they've really been giving me a headache. <laughs> those who commit acts of violence against the person or violence against animals and they usually come from outside the village. I'm thinking Simon Pemberton who attacked Debbie mm -hmm. um, and more recently Matt and his fraudulent cronies fleecing the irritating the ageing of Ambridge but we can also <laughs> see the unrepentant Clive Horobin as the paper talked about last year and we've talked about today um, the Horobins are always pinned as outsiders of the village. The only person I can immediately think of who caused fear in the village and from the village is Roy, who talked about his remorse for perpetrating hate crime against Usha while Jill was assaulting a celebrity chef. <laughs> Generally, we see those who cause fear being held at arm's length from the social cohesion of Ambridge. They arrive disrupt, leave, without waiting for healing to occur. And it's the outsiders, some rural populations, believe that are committing the real-life countryside and rural crime, even though the empirical evidence suggests that this isn't the case. I'm beginning to think that this should be some residents are insurgents after this <laughs> So our firstly thinking about rural crime and offenders, as Norby puts it, might mean that those who are feckless, always on the periphery of criminal activity, are considered benign in communities. It may be, as Smith says, the ingrained culture of silence within rural communities, 
rather than being blackmailed by an emeritus professor, that stops Joe from being reported to the police for selling tumble tussock. It was most certainly the culture of silence that enabled Nelson Gabriel to live for so long in Ambridge without being sent down. Yeah, nice little Gabriel, eh? So we know that the vast majority of those people who are in our prisons are there for short amounts of time, and not a danger to the public, and are in for offences which can be linked to deprivation and poverty. While we have our Eds, Jazzers, Georges, um, what we see is that Ambridge's criminal community is not typical of the offenders in our prisons or on probation. The crimes committed recently in Ambridge are not typical of what of the crime actually being experienced in rural communities. Again, until recently, the crimes of the middle classes in Ambridge were swept, often swept aside, ignored, excused, <coughs> manipulated out of existence. Badger killing, truck crashing, the throwing of baked goods, which is disguised as what I like to call flapjacktivism. <laughs> trifles of middle class criminal activities, they seem to be the thing of the past. We're now seeing fear instilled by the consequences of activities such as poor, uh, fraud and the poisoning of waterways. Brian, choose which one you will, <laughs> is already deploying the techniques of neutralisation in dealing with his possible criminal activity. He's denying responsibility. He's denying injury. He's condemning those who are condemning his past behaviour. And what we might find, that unlike those who are considered feckless, but hold an important social position in Ambridge, is that Brian's social capital might be easily broken, leaving him in a difficult position after any punishment for his crimes, assuming, of course, he is charged and found guilty. So, lastly, this might be the poster woman for desistance as well. James said to Lillian about Matt, and Leopard never changes its spots, Ma, but this certainly isn't the case. Just this week, we've heard the impact of a custodial sentence on the attempt to build a management career. The 1974 Rehabilitation of Offenders Act has got a lot to answer for. Hasn't it, Susan? <laughs> the Archers is full of those who've changed their lives and continue on the road from crime. Sid Perks, Ed, Jazza, all of those spring to mind. Desisting from crime is shown in Ambridge. People grow out of crime, they reinvent themselves, and they believe in a new identity which is often instigated by the love of a good woman. <laughs> Let's think about Emma and put her aside. <laughs> Social capital is an important element in secondary assistance. Again, we see this in the, uh, both in Ed and Jazza's lives. People might disapprove of their behaviour, but the ties they have in Ambridge help them to remain former offenders. <coughs> Yet people zigzag on the way to desistance, and it might only take the provocation of the constant, insulting digs of a priggish brother to trigger re-offending. Okay. So, rural crime is under-researched in criminology, something which might not be surprising given the much lower crime rates and the lower fear of crimes in rural areas in comparison to what might happen in Falkersham. There isn't a crime rate sweeping Ambridge, despite what it might feel like. Ambridge's offenders aren't typical of prison and probation populations, and while I certainly wouldn't wish a prison sentence on anybody, I'm quite <coughs> looking forward to seeing whether Brian does turn into Noel Coward's Mr. Bridger from the Italian job when he gets sent down. <laughs>